From KGW, this is The Good Stuff. First on The Good Stuff, in one of Oregon's largest counties, volunteers are working to help the most vulnerable kids. Thank you for joining us. I'm Christine Pitawanich. A unique approach in Washington County is really being used to ensure all kids have the stability they need to thrive. Thomas Schultz has the story. Summer break can be an exciting time for some kids and turbulent for others living on the street. When your basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing are not met and you're experiencing homelessness, it's really hard to get on your feet. In Beaverton alone, almost 1,900 kids are homeless. It's a problem Washington County Housing Services is trying to combat through a new shelter. On any given night, there are over 100 kids staying here at the Bridge Home. Last year, the county converted a motel into a shelter, which program directors say serves more than 100 people at a time. And hundreds more are on a wait list for this Tigard shelter and several others like it, which functions not just as a shelter, but a classroom serving students on summer break. In the coming months, kids will learn about science, nature, and cooking, and have homework too. So we're just gearing up to actually get our summer programming in place for all of the kids. Which could combat low graduation rates among homeless students. Just 65% graduate statewide. And open opportunities for people like Maria Isabel and her kids, who recently moved from Venezuela. We spoke to her through an interpreter. We don't have any other place to go or any other family. And you know this shelter has opened the doors for me and my family. A door and hopefully a chance for families to get back on their feet. This building has been a game changer for our community. Again, that was Thomas Schultz reporting. At the Tiger location, two thirds of families are finding permanent housing. That's 10% higher than families at similar shelters in the region. We also want to take this opportunity to remind you that KGW and Safeway are teaming up to beg summer hunger. Students and families who rely on school meals during the school year are faced with food insecurity during the summer. But you can help make a difference. You can buy a bag of the most needed food items when you're checking out at Safeway and those bags will go to families that need them. For more information, go to bagsummerhunger.com. We've also got a bunch of a web got a bunch of information rather on our KGW website. Hey, graduation season is upon us, and it was an extra special graduation in Corvallis this past weekend. Oregon State University says a record number of students graduated on Saturday. We're talking more than 7,600. NFL running back and former Beaver Steven Jackson gave the commencement address. Of course, big congrats to all the grads at all of our local schools. And from one high to a low, Oregon ranks last in the U.S. when it comes to investments in K-12 computer science education. But a new program could change that. A University of Oregon professor helped develop the program called Computer Science for Oregon. The curriculum emphasizes hands-on learning and focuses on things like problem solving, web design, even artificial intelligence. The goal? To roll it out to Oregon schools, opening doors to students who may be female, black, indigenous, or others who historically have not had the same opportunities to explore computer science. I think it's very important. We want um, our students not only to be users of new technologies in society, but also be creators in ways that address problems in their own communities, um, serve as a form of self-expression. And we also want the creators of new technologies in the technology industry to represent the, the people in the communities. The hope is that by the 2027-2028 school year, every Oregon K-12 school will offer access to a computer science class. State funding is still needed for the program to be implemented. I always love that music. Okay, all month long we are highlighting local influential people in the LGBTQ plus community. And today we are shining the spotlight on Marie Equi, a standout in the fight for women's suffrage and reproductive care. Stephanie Domerat has her story.
Henry Equi was a pioneer in more ways than one. Born in Massachusetts in 1872, she came to Oregon at age 20 to live on a homestead in the Dalles with her lover in an openly lesbian relationship long before the word lesbian was common. She was a woman willing to fight for what she thought was right. At age 21, she horsewhipped the school superintendent in the Dalles for refusing to pay her partner's salary. Equi taught herself enough to get into medical school and opened a practice in Portland, providing reproductive care to working class women, including birth control and abortions, which were illegal at the time. In 1916, she was arrested with prominent birth control advocate Margaret Sanger for distributing Sanger's birth control booklet. In 1901, she and another lesbian partner adopted a baby girl and raised her together even after their relationship ended. Equi was the only female doctor who joined what became known as the Oregon Doctor Train, a relief mission that responded to the 1906 San Francisco fire and earthquake. Equi spent her life fighting for women's suffrage, one of the earliest women in Oregon to register to vote and for jury duty, and for workers' rights labeled dangerous and insane for fighting with police and told to leave the state, which she refused. She was also against war, protesting and giving speeches ahead of World War I. That landed her with nearly a year in prison, convicted of sedition, for which she was later pardoned by President Franklin Roosevelt. After her release, she lived in Portland with her partner Elizabeth and continued to practice medicine until 1930. She died in 1952 and is buried in Portland. Again, that was Stephanie Domerot reporting. If you'd like to hear more stories like Equi's, we've got a full playlist of our Pride Month Breaking Barriers series. It's up right now at KGW.com. Now to a Portland summer tradition. Round two of Portland's Sunday Parkways kicked off this past weekend. This one, located in Northeast Cully, closed off several streets to cars, allowing people to freely explore the streets. Groups also got excited about getting people of all backgrounds into bike riding. This adaptive bike clinic allowed people to try different kinds of bikes. While they've got bikes for people with disabilities, they also are giving test rides, or gave test rides rather, for people looking for a different style of bike. There are so many people stopping by the booth on the other side, asking questions, and people with a variety of different issues and not even recognizing that there's a chance for them to be participating in cycling again. Now, even if they're not here, you might have a family member that says, hey, mm -hmm. did you know you could? And then they are able to get hooked up with us. So the next Sunday Parkways will be held in Southwest Portland. That'll be in September. A new section of the Willamette National Forest that was burned in the 2020 Labor Day wildfires is set to reopen this week. This is Butte Creek Falls. The Oregon Department of Forestry says crews have been working over the last four years to clean up the area and make it accessible for visitors. They've removed dozens of burned trees and rebuilt trails in that spot. Together, the Beachy Creek and Lion's Head fires burned more than 400,000 acres. Butte Creek Falls will officially reopen on Friday. Still ahead on the good stuff, a great way a lot of people like to spend time with their dads involves fishing, right? Grant McComey shows us where kids, their dads, maybe their granddads too, are teaming up to reel in a big catch. But first, let's take a step outside. Look at this gorgeous shot from our sky cam in the Dalles. Stay with us for more on the good stuff.
weekend, many of us celebrated Father's Day, and maybe some of you went fishing with Dad. Grant McComey takes us on a fishing adventure in the Columbia River Gorge, where six million fish, called shad, are migrating upriver and, in the process, helping people make some memories. If there is a better dad's dream day than this, I don't know where or when. They all have fish on. That's pretty cool. Oh, even he has a fish on. <laughs> Neither does fishing guide Bill Monroe. Yeah, Catching shad magic, with the small fry in the sprawling and scenic Columbia Gorge. We're fishing in the middle of a mountain range. We're right smack dab in the middle of the Cascades. You don't see that everywhere. It's pretty unique. I love it. I just love it. Let's get this rod out. Bill cherishes his time with the youngsters when millions of five-pound shad, distant cousins to herring, make their annual run up the Columbia River. You'll see all of a sudden, they'll have a fish on, then they'll have a fish on, and then all of us will have a fish on, and it'll just go like that for the whole day, just on and off. His boys, Billy and Grayson, and their cousin, Amelia, with her dad, Jared, like that too. They almost look like oversized herring, yeah. Kind of are. Actually, yeah. Oh, Amelia got one. It's oh, pulling really hard. This invitation to non-stop catching has a certain casino-like appeal. They're everywhere. Gambling on who can lift the fish straight to the cooler. No nets allowed. So we call it shad roulette. Yeah. Here's how it works. This is called fair chase shad fishing. We don't need to net it. Okay, Amelia, go ahead and lift a little bit. You ready? If we get it, we get it. Oh, we got it! There he is. Oh, there he is. Well, it's a fish. The cooler is open. Shad roulette is upon us. Will yes. we get it? Three, right. two, one, and take off. Oh, we nice! Got it. Directly in there. Nice. Meanwhile, the kid's granddad is having a dream day, too. So many fish, so much laughter, and smiles as wide as the river. People want to fish for something, and they're, and they're going to. And shad happen to be abundant and easy to fish for, and of course, great for kids. It's a natural for youngsters. These are the good old days for shad. <laughs> it seems millions. like it's just about every year. <laughs> but millions of fish. <laughs> millions, of, millions of fish in hundreds of years. <laughs> shad have been labeled the founding fish. Historians say Shad saved the American troops from certain starvation at Valley Forge in 1777. The East Coast transplant was brought out west in the 1870s. The table fare is fine, cooked, brined, and pickled, or even smoked. So if you were to smoke a Shad, or two, or three, or four, how, how would you go about it? I'd grind it up, put it in a pipe, and light it. <laughs> 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 okay. Tackle is simple enough. Small spinners with just enough lead to get the rig down to the bottom. They like this so much because it does this just crazy type of like swimming action in the water. And they love it. The color seem to matter? Yeah. Shad really like this chartreuse type stuff. Uh, this guy over here next to us is using a red white spoon. That works pretty good too. Oh, it's just like that excitement when the fish gets on the hook and you're like with everybody else and everybody's excited for you. Well, what I like about it is that there's always something happening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's always something going on. Yeah. It's like one fish there and another fish there. Yeah. This is actually such a plentiful resource. It's very underutilized. The kids can come out here. They have non-stop action. It's consistent enough to keep them entertained and get them like into the outdoors. I like that. Shad fishing continues through June. On the Columbia River with photographer Jeff Kastner, Grant McComey, KGW. Well, that video does not get old. It's beautiful. You can catch Grant's Getaways half hour show on Saturdays and Sundays right here on KGW. Now check out these Father's Day photos from Portland Fire and Rescue. That's Alex Sparks on the left and his father, Steve Sparks, on the right. This is after the two finished putting out a structure fire on Sunday. Alex signed up for an overtime shift knowing his dad was scheduled to work on Father's Day.
He actually realized there was a vacancy here and and asked me to see what I could do about getting them here if there was uh, a po possible overtime shift, and it worked out. It's always really uh, kind of a good good day when you get to work with your son. Oh, that's so sweet. So they're not the only father-son duo on the team. Take a look at Ryan Fox in the truck with his son, Sam Fox. Not long after finishing his training, Sam joined fire crews that his dad headed up. So cool. And hey, we also asked you last week to share some shout outs to your dad or father figure in your life who wanted to keep spreading the love by sharing some additional posts. Casey sent this photo of her dad with her mom. She says her dad is her hero in his leather cape. She says she's very thankful to have him through all of life's ups and downs. I love that. And Tiffany posted this tribute to her father who passed away last year. She says while he's not her biological father, she's been honored to call him dad since she was just a few months old. And Teresita added this photo of her dad saying, happy heavenly Father's Day, rest in love. Gosh, really love all those shout outs. And by the way, speaking of shout outs, we always want to hear about the good stuff happening in your life or community. So you can text us photos, any tips at any time at the number on your screen. That's 503-226-5088. You can also email us at thegoodstuff at kgw.com. Okay, coming up on The Good Stuff, meet that guy, Poncho, he's being called a hero today for saving his family from an intruder. But it wasn't easy for him. We'll explain what happened. And also here's another live look outside, this time from our reserve golf course sky cam in Aloha. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
Welcome back. A dog who lives in New Mexico is capturing hearts around the world. His name is Poncho and his story is going viral after he risked his life to protect his family from a potential intruder last week. Santa Fe deputies say a 16 year old with a knife trespassed on the family's property. The dog then put up a fight and in the process, the suspect stabbed Poncho's neck then took off. Poncho's family wrapped his neck with towels and they drove miles looking for an emergency vet. But there was no luck, so they rushed Poncho to where it all started for him at the Humane Society. As we were prepping him for surgery, his heart did stop. Um, our vet was able to resuscitate him with medications. Aw, and after hours apart, Poncho was reunited with his family. That is so sweet. He's getting stronger every single day. I'm sure all the love that he's getting online is definitely helping, you know, with all the good vibes and all. We hope Poncho gets better soon. Coming up, a local comic store is throwing a mini, mini Comic Con on Portland streets. How they're working to help new creators and build community when we return. annual gathering of local artists and comic book fans returned to Portland this weekend. On Saturday, local business Books with Pictures held its third annual WhipCon. <laughs> the free convention took over Southeast Orange Avenue and it turned it into an artist's alley of sorts, featuring a mix of local comics, writers, artists, and illustrators. The shop's owner says she loves the chance to create a community of comic lovers and support future creators. It's really a chance to give people a platform and a voice to show off what they do to connect with each other and with uh, the people in our neighborhood. Yeah, so interesting. WhipCon, who would have known? So this year, the convention grew to take up two blocks, and that is actually double the space from years past. 
Hey, that is all the time that we have. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here on The Good Stuff. Before we head out, though, we'll leave you with this beautiful shot from our Cannon Beach Skycam. Again, enjoy it, soak it in. I'll see you right back here tomorrow.